done. So this is the part I hate when we finally get a chance to start talking, and I've got to be the horrible taskmistress to bring you all back. But I promise this isn't going to be the only time you're going to have to speak amongst yourselves. I would like to make sure that we've got an opportunity, though, before we move on to our next speaker, to get some initial comments, questions back from the group. Um, again, I'd like to ask that they be brief for now so that we make sure that we've got enough time to get to our next two speakers and then have enough time for our open discussion today. Um, there's a lot of great conversation happening around the room and I want to respect the fact that there are some groups who are going to be ready right now with lots of questions and are going to be wanting to speak and some others who aren't quite yet wanting to, to launch out into the big group. So I'm not going to call on you table by table, but what I will do is start, um, I'll start on the left. I always think it's good to start on the left. And maybe from the back and then moving forward just to see if we've got questions or comments from the floor. And when you do, if you uh, come to your table, if you can stand up or speak loudly and introduce yourself so that we get a chance to see who our friends and allies are in the room. I'm back. Um, my name is Nicola Hall, and I'm one of the founding members of From Grief to Action, which is the association of families and friends of drug users. I have two sons who are both on methadone and on welfare. And um, I guess one of my comments, I'm not sure if it's a question, is that um, if methadone is supposed to stabilize people so that they can get off welfare or to work lead normal lives, then why is there not some uh, mechanism for uh, covering the pharmacy fees if they do that? Because if you come off welfare to start work, it's probably going to be at a minimum wage, and then you are slapped with enormous pharmacy fees for every time you have to go pick up your medicine. And you have to pick it up every day. There's an infilled this, this incentive to come off You have to come off welfare if you're on welfare. like to, to weigh in. I guess I will give each turn first and see if there's one of our speakers who'd like to take it up right now or somebody from BCA Palm who might want to who might want to chime in on this issue or we can or we can take it as a as a very well deserved uh, criticism. Diane did you uh, just about that going to work it's we don't get carries in this. If you live in the downtown east side you don't get carries. Period. And it's because of the address. You can go to a doctor just up on 45th and Fraser, and if you've got an address up there, you can get carries. I got carries up there all the time, like weekly and monthly. But down here, nobody gets carries. Your mother can die, and they will not give you a carry. And how can you go to work when you have to pick up? You've got to be at work at 6.30, and these drugstores close, like, on... Uh, Saturday and Sunday at 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock. If you're working weekends, you know, like, you, got, you leave for work at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, they're not open yet, and you get off at 4 in the afternoon and they're closed. How can you work? You know, it's ridiculous. I know that's an issue that has been, comes up over and over again for, for a lot of people, and really an important one about how is it that we can use this medication more effectively to help people make that transition into work, into school, getting on with their lives yeah. in other different ways, and that for a lot of people, that's possible, and for a lot of people, it's not. Yeah. And to try and understand a little bit more clearly how and why that is, I think, is a really important part of, of uh, taking up a, a social justice focus. I saw your hand here. Did you want to respond? Okay, and I saw yours. Did you want to respond to Diane's point immediately? Okay, maybe what I'll do is I'll just move along here, and then we'll come to you if that's yeah. all right. All right, cool. Do we have any other questions from these sort of tables towards back and moving forward? Yes. Some place you go to and it's like all juice, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't taste the at all. And then there's other places where it's... Yeah, so strong. 
<laughs> put you in the nod, yeah. yeah. Well, that links back to some of the points Vicky made as well, right? Just around some of the some of the media coverage that happened around 2008, with with a lot of really unscrupulous practices that were being found at some pharmacies. Certainly not everywhere, because we had some good evidence also from Vicky's study that uh, things are different in other places. But we should certainly have a system where we can rely on the fact that if we go into a licensed pharmacy in this community, that we can expect good care, regardless of whose door we walk into. And that doesn't seem to be the case yet. No. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask this woman from Australia. Um, you say there's a lot of similarities between Australia and Canada and that. And uh, I was just wondering, how, how do the, um, people pay for um, their methadone in Australia? Is it like healthcare or is it just uh, government? Um? So there's, there's two systems. There's a, a public clinic. Actually, there's three. There's public clinic, a private clinic, and pharmacy dispensing. And if you're in a public clinic, it's usually um, initial intake and stabilisation, and it's free. But as soon as you go to a private clinic or a pharmacy, it's a daily dispensing fee, which might be $3 to $7 a day. And there's no, um, that's it, it's just $3 or $7 a day. And so there's some <coughs> systems where if people can't uh, pay their pharmacy bills, they're sometimes given financial respite, where they'll go back to the public clinic for a little while. If they've got a big electricity bill or something and they can't pay their pharmacy bill, they move back to the public system a couple of weeks or a month or something just to get some finance back. But, you know, same thing, many people are on um, uh, welfare and very limited income and that, you know, 35 to 50 bucks a week really chews up the very small amounts of money that they pay. So it's an enforced poverty. So that's a part that, is that, so there's no option to stay within that public clinic or is it just really limited? Yeah, the waiting lists are so long. I was just in the second largest city in New South Wales last week and they have um, a huge program, hundreds of people on their public program and they have a waiting list of 12 months. So, oh, you know, people ring up and say, I'm ready for treatment today. You know, it's a big decision for lots of people to say, I'm ready for treatment oh, yeah. today. Keep calling, but you know you can travel two hours and pick up in Sydney. If two hours each way, you know there's private clinics down there that will take you, but we can't take you for 12 months. And you know again, what what choices do people have in those situations? But to keep doing what they're doing when they're really ready to change, it's stupid. Yeah. Uh, I'm, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name's Ross. I, my my question is um, of the. Quite a large number of people are on methadone. Um, it's maybe about 10% that are going down, um, about 30 that are standard, and then about the other 60% that are going up in methadone use. Um, why is it fluctuating so bad, and is it more predominantly because of people maintaining in the sense with a heroin problem, or also just maintaining as a methadone problem? That's a very good question. Is there somebody who'd like to take that up? Either here or elsewhere in the room, actually. Um, I'm not, I've actually um, have uh, close friends that, you know, I have close friends that have actually been put on methadone and their drug of choice with crack cocaine and not opiates. And I'm seeing it more and more as a common thing to be putting at, just addicts in general on methadone. Yeah, that's so that's true. happening a lot. It's mm -hmm. happening a lot more and more. I've seen more people on, that are methamphetamine and are being put on methadone. Yes. Why would you do that? I don't Why in creation would you yeah. do that? You're giving them enough of them that are yeah. So I see your hand at the back there. Yeah, we brought uh, we brought needle exchange out of the Washington <coughs> doing a number of us. Charles is outside uh, addicts for years and years. I'm not, but what we're seeing is the massive over over prescription of, of methadone. The use the use of methadone as the standard treatment for drug addiction. Yeah. And it's being applied. That's where we came. It's being applied to all over the place as, as uh, for pain management and to calm coke addicts down. Yeah. Uh, we went through many years, we went through a situation where one of the local doctors would prescribe it, uh, it, would, would, it would encourage you to go on it and in return you'd get your HIV meds. That, was, along that got resolved. But one of the problems is nobody, when, when people go on uh, methadone and it fails, they just vanish into the woodwork. So people see the successes, but they don't see the failures. Mm -hmm. And no addict is going to, 
no, the average addict on the street isn't going to complain to the, to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Mm -hmm. And nor is he going to complain to his doctor because the doctor's hand is, is the pusher that's handing out the drugs that's going to be really blunt about it. So we're really alarmed at the overprescription. And the stats show that. You see a massive increase in it. Uh, older drug addicts, most of them won't touch it. They want other options. One option, and a lot of older addicts have said, geez, I would really like to have some laudanum and cigarettes. <laughs> because it's a nice, short, mellow high. Whereas methadone, I, I, I have taken methadone, I can't comment firsthand, but a lot of people go on it, then they get the blockade effect. And they go back to heroin. The heroin doesn't work. They switch to cocaine, and then you end up with multiple addictions. You're, what's happening is creating a whole subclass of, of new addicts with multiple addiction, but not everybody. Some people it works for us. You get, it really needs to, you need to have screaming, screening and monitoring, and it should Choices. definitely be given to young people. So that reminds me as well about